with us today from Singanawa Lodge. Um, she's a well-known character amongst the sort of travel community, a great um, uh, art collector and, and so runs a, a fantastic lodge uh, on the borders of Kana. So delighted to have her here really to talk about weaving, how to weave um, culture, uh, tribal communities into itineraries, into your, your um, uh, travel programs, because it's a really, it's a really difficult thing to do really well, and it requires a lot of very good people on the ground to allow that to happen. And so, um, even though she'll probably be based very much on our own expertise and experience in her own destination, we need to be encouraging this much more as a way of um, making travel itineraries much more sustainable um, going forward. So I'm um, really looking forward to hearing her journey of how she does it and how, how she does it through her own purposes. So Talika, thank you for taking the time and I'll now let you off the hook and you can start. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be here and talk about something that is very close to my heart. As the director of an ecologically responsible property within central India, I've been on a mission to define, introduce, grow, and sustain the charm of Kanha and its rustic grandeur through the medium of tourism that honors traditions and values. My team are committed towards ecological restoration and meaningful long-term engagements with the land, the wildlife, and the people of central India. I believe and I seriously believe that the tourism in India across its various facets, be it the properties or travel organizations and tour entities can act as a symbol to bond the people of yesterday, today and tomorrow, whether they belong to the urban or indigenous background. Curated travel programs can play a very important role in serving as a connection to embrace the heartbeats of India's indigenous and tribal communities with visitors far and wide. From my personal professional journey, I've observed that visiting tribal people and ind indigenous communities over the course of the last decade has not only become more popular, but also much easier to do. Men and women from India's indigenous tribes that once actually stared at us from coffee table books, glossy magazines, are now so accessible to travelers, responsible travelers, as I like to call them. Many people find ancient ways of life fascinating. I mean, I'm actually obsessed about it. We're living in an era that is dominated by a world of concrete, supermarkets, fashion, celebrity culture, stressful jobs, and unfortunately, diminishing community spirit. It's of no surprise that every other visitor to my jungle lodge in Kana finds the idea of people living together close to nature in the same way they have for centuries extremely appealing. For many travelers, there's nothing like bridging centuries of modern development and making a connection with people whose lives are so very different from our own. And those of us who are fortunate enough to have visited and listened properly with a um, you know, we've also seen uh, that there's so much they can teach us and their society, even though it's different, teaches us a lot. And we learn a lot from their world. Many indigenous groups in India have been unfortunately marginalized. And I've seen that on a personal level. And they've been derided by other communities. And for some of these, meeting people with a genuine interest and respect for them is important. However, the journey to meeting tourists and inviting them into their villages or homes is a very complex one. And it's a responsibility of tourism entities to handle this in an ethical and responsible way. Integrating tribal culture in guest itineraries involves extensive onus by a tourism expert who knows exactly how to facilitate a form of tourism that is led by and empowers the indigenous people living in and around a region. I call it CBT or community-based tourism at its very best. In a two-way street where tourism both provides local employment and income for education, development, 
and conservation initiatives, while at the same time giving both indigenous people and traveling guests a unique opportunity for cultural exchange. And you can actually see that at a very personal level when you see what I've been doing with the Singinawa Conservation Foundation. It is often with the help of an outside facilitator that the community becomes aware of the commercial and social value placed on their natural and cultural heritage and is encouraged to become actively involved in the conservation of these resources. So I've you know, basically penned down some of my suggestions and I would like to share it with all of you. The best advice is to be sensitive to local people's reaction to your visit and also being sensitive to their history and way of life. Traveling with a tour company with a proven track record and a guide who speaks the same language. So, you know, you should have somebody who speaks Baiga, Gond, uh, you know, all the various languages in Central India if you're traveling there, or somebody who knows, uh, you know, the languages of the Minas if you're traveling in Ranthambor. So uh, have somebody who speaks a local language. Progressive tourist properties are actively engaging with guides from the local community to ensure that the traveling guests benefit from their knowledge. Guests should be encouraged to take time to read up online on the people they may be interacting with. Uh, the Singinawa Lodge Library has a lot of books on indigenous art, on indigenous culture. So uh, our, uh, our uh, guests are encouraged to read about them so that uh, they already know, uh, you know what they are going to experience. A big part of any retreat is also what one eats. At Singinawa Jungle Lodge, for example, we take pride in giving our guests a taste of mawa. It's a region's local brew, the smell of fermenting mawa. It's called Maduka Longifolia. I'm very fond of botany, so we love telling them about botany. Flowers and wood smoke hanging heavy in the air makes for a perfect do-it-yourself session. Well, I'm also a literature student and I love Oscar Wilde's famous words, life imitates art far, far more than art imitates life. So I've been greatly inspired by these words. Tourist properties can line up visits to museum and cultural centers, which are preserving indigenous art of the re region. For example, the Kana Museum of Life and Art, which is a thousand square feet museum existing within the Singinawa estate, sings an epic of the native Gond, Baiga, Bheel, and Bastar artisans and their labors of love. The pottery village experience within the premises of the museum is an extension of our collaboration with unsung heroes from the Baiga community. So you can also you know, visit them, buy their um, uh, pots and uh, all the various things that they make. And it's very interesting to see that because the Baiga community is painstakingly keeping the aura of the region's pottery alive. Opening the doors of art forms to visiting tra travelers is a gateway to culture, to people, to conversations and learning, and just an overall universal connection with the guests. Hosting art installations in the open. In fact, we, we are curating a, a, a walkthrough art installation, first of its kind, a kind of walkthrough in, uh, which is going to be an extension of the museum at Singinawa. So you can actually see art installations in the wild that talk about conservation apart from wildlife. So it's very important to host art installation in the open with a focus on your region. It's a visual learning experience for guests as well as an approach which others can certainly put into practice. Curating musical experiences for the guests in conjunction with the natives of the region and the symbolic association of a dance form with the cor corresponding time of the year is a perfect way to immerse within the aura of music and sounds of the indigenous communities. Musical lights can act as platforms for guests to watch magical performances, maybe around a bonfire. And that's a perfect time to you know, uh, talk about local gond uh, folklore and jungle stories and how it's woven into their habitat. 
in most cases, the guests, the guests do end up joining in the celebrations, in the dance forms. Singinawa encourages all its guests to participate in village and market fair visits, a practice I urge tourist properties to take up in a focused manner. The daily activities for the guests at the lodge allow our guests to observe these communities and get involved in the day-to-day -day affairs like music, tribal dancing, painting, pottery, food and costumes, organizing several performances and workshops. The shop by the canopy at Singinawa houses curated handicrafts, which I've done personally, and other artifacts made by the Kond and Baiga tribes and other indigenous artisans of India. Tourism entities need to consciously create platforms for guests to take back creations made by tribal community, a move which should go a long way in supporting heritage art forms. I'm always available to share my experiences with the industry fraternity. Let's all come together and share knowledge to create more responsible and re enriching experiences for our guests. We live in an incredible India. Let's embrace all that it has to offer. It's time to get going and explore. I would also like to share a beautiful video of the Kana Museum of Life and Art that was curated by my close friend, Dr. Alka Pandey, to give a feel of the cultural ethos of that region. I'm just going to request the TOF team to please share the video now. Uh, you can all see my screen. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay.
Okay, I think uh, there are quite a few questions. I'm going to do the, uh, you know, I'm going to answer all the questions now. And then, um, since I don't know if everybody knows, I'm also an uh, art gallerist, uh, and I promote indigenous art forms of India. So I am going to take you all, uh, it's going to be like a sneak peek view of Must Art Gallery. And um, I've curated some masterpieces that, um, are going to be uh, spoken about. And before that, I'm just going to answer all these questions. Let me just... Yeah, uh, um, let, let, let's um, allow the individuals to ask the questions. So I can see um, some questions are pending. Yeah, down. so feel, feel free for them to come on and, and ask those questions. So we've got a number of questions here. Let's... Um, um, so thanks for that lovely, lovely... Um, videos i mean just shows the magnificence of of cultural art and how skilled these people are and to some extent what we're missing to a great extent in terms of people visiting you know from abroad particularly but also you know the domestic community when we don't incorporate tribal communities into uh, into activities and and uh, in a way that allows them to be the the owners of those um and what you've done is is fantastic so let's just um let's just take a few questions so uh, prativa would you like to just um uh, come online and, and ask to leak it direct you can we can uh, we can let people interact here a little bit Prativa, are you there? Uh, so Prativa did ask uh, how to uh, how do the, the how do you find your communities react to visitors? Is that something that's taken them a long time to to get used to? To Liga? Uh, well, I've been going to Kana National Park for more than twenty seven years now, and I've also been visiting uh, since I am a uh, you know my dad was a owner of a tea estate so i've you know frequently visited parts of bengal and uh, visited a lot of indigenous communities uh, they are very open to welcoming you as long as as long as you are sensitive towards them they they like a lot of sensitivity when you approach them you should be uh, you know you should be very appreciative and if you are and if you you know if you work towards the community like everybody in kanha knows that I uh, work very closely with the communities. I'm helping the Bhor Singh School, the schools in the Koka village. So they are very uh, welcoming to our uh, guests. So it all uh, stems down to being very sensitive towards them. Then there's another uh, question, which is very uh, similar, which says, what is your take on photography of tribes in the village or in the weekly market? I again said that in my introductory um, speech, if you can call that, that you need to be very sensitive uh, when you're photographing these tribes. You have to take their permission. You have to take their consent. In fact, uh, I've just been a publisher of a book called Jal Jungle Jameen, which is the first of its kind uh, indigenous, and, um, indigenous book on uh, the art and culture of Chhattisgarh. And uh, we did, uh, my team of photographers, did photograph uh, tribes all over Chhattisgarh when we were making this book and Dr. Pandey was writing about it. So it was, you know, we took a lot of permissions. We took their consent before we photographed them and they were very willing. Yeah, good. And because that is, you know, one of the one of the issues in places like Chhattisgarh and certainly Orissa, they actually closed down tourism because it was so focused on on the sort of camera clicking junkie and and that is is a major issue and and one as as a traveler and certainly as an operator taking travelers has to understand that actually you wouldn't like that sort of approach done on you so why should you uh, impose it on others so what what are your the sort of absolute takeaways what is the key to allowing people to ingratiate themselves I mean, for me, it's often about time, giving people time, giving them time to do that. What are, what, are you, what are the key ways in which you found people react best or, or tribal communities react best to, to visitors? If you are giving back to them, 
if somehow you manage to do some you know small deed whatever if you take some gifts for them or you you know it's just not going there and start you know clicking your camera if you take some little gifts for them or you you know you uh, probably give them some plants or you know anything because they uh, they rely on uh, you know nature to sustain themselves so maybe you know our guests at our uh, lodge they take bamboo saplings for them they take stationery for their children so i suggest uh, you know some sort of uh, token in kind uh, goes a long way and then they're more welcoming because they realize that you know they're getting back when you're meeting them and of course if you you know buy their art uh, then of course then you're you know definitely sus helping sustain them so i think that's a good way of going about it but i think i, I think it's not a good idea to give anything to the children because it teaches them begging uh well actually many of them uh, don't have notebooks they don't have stationery and it's not really begging because uh, they are they they are actually uh, studying there in the local village schools so when you're giving them uh, stationery on and you're giving them books on wildlife it's not really um, you know uh, it, you know you can give to begging of any ma'am you can give to the school not to the children directly because uh, in that case you know when next group of tourists go they ask give me pen give me books give me this and that so that's a very bad practice uh, been done in by tour operators in many areas well i beg to differ because anyway they are living in such uh, meager uh, things and just uh, and giving a few pens for their education would just help them uh, uplift them it's not going to take away from them no i think you can give it to the, the parents is good but to give it to the school teacher you will give after you leave the place not when you are there yeah so, but yeah the thing is it can vary from you know region to region and person to person it's i think what is most important is that the i think the people feel need to feel feel respected and even if they ask i think the children are like children so even if they ask i think sometimes it's okay to go into their thing of course it should not you know they have to be groomed into not to be really the you know or asking and like that or whatever but more important is that um, you know a child like behavior which is okay i mean i mean that's what i would think well, so in, in my that, view you know, have more in my, well, in my view when you visit the tribal area particularly sensitive area You should not take your camera with you. Yeah, these the are moment, these the are very broad camera, things, you know. The you know, the moment you have the camera, you try to see the things with your lens, not with your eyes. Uh, I mean, we can't control people, so I mean, I, <laughs> you, have to, you have to control people when you're traveling to the sensitive area. Hmm. That's the responsible tourism. No, well, I, you, you, you are right to a great extent. I mean, the photography does create a, a, a major barrier. It puts, it puts. So we know, we know it's a major issue, and I would encourage people who are photographers to spend half an hour just talking and ingratiating, maybe by some of the art, that sort of stuff. Then you can bring it out. So it, it's, a, it's a different way of of getting them involved, seeing that you're not just taking and, and fleeing. So it's a, it's a two way street in, in terms of doing. And, Wouldn't you agree with that, Chalika? You, you've probably been on the end of that photographic sort of yeah. I mean, you, have, you have to give time. You, you you can't visit one day and take picture. If you go there two days yeah, yeah, yeah. or you have little time, then sit down, relax, have a chat with them, then take a consent and take a picture. But what's happened, unfortunately, in tourism industry, people get down from their car, start clicking first. That's really happening in every of the whatever the travel area you're talking. I've been traveling also a lot. and responsible i mean in tribal tourism for last 20 years and that's the problem we face in each places where you go and even now the tribes are coming and starting give me money before you take picture so that's really very sad affairs now the moment yeah it's undoubtedly true it's it's a problem but it's a problem worldwide it's not a problem just uh, what's name so chilika i don't know how you you would encourage encourage that that relationship you've talked about you know gifts and things but i it's it's time i think more than anything else give people time before getting to that point where you say do you mind if i take a yeah, photo exactly. yeah exactly exactly comes in only yeah absolutely i completely agree with uh, both of you and uh, you have to work with the community your lodge has to work with the community you should you should be 
your lord should be well known uh, in the community for working with them for doing for them and then automatically when uh, you know your naturalist or your uh, manager goes with the guests they they welcome you with open arms in fact i'm yet to meet a, a child or a villager in any of my travelers asking me for money and i've traveled extensively all over india and i've been to rural parts of india because um, the first thing i ask them is that you know what is the uh, local handicraft of that region what what are they producing are they doing any kind of art form and since i am an indigenous art gallerist if they are uh, you know uh, painting something on their walls i i like to offer them uh, you know uh, various mediums of uh, uh, you know art like paper or canvases and encourage them to paint on that and they're very excited about that because when they see uh, you know when they come to the cities and they see exhibitions of their art forms they're very thrilled with the whole concept yeah so, normally what we do we ask our guests to come the come with the pictures of their family their pets their landscape their houses so we start conver conversation with showing those pictures first look they believe in this kind of how they this is their agriculture they drink potatoes this and that and we start showing pictures of their landscape european landscape american landscape where they're from and it builds a relationship first and people are curious they want to see what the picture is all about then slowly it it you can start conversation and again it creates atmosphere that okay we can take a couple of picture of your landscape your houses to so back in home thank you sir there's, there's another question here if we would mind sonia do you want to ask it um you kindly put up a if you're happy to come come live and uh, ask Talika direct are you are you there are you yes ready? yes hi hi jojin hi talika hi. Uh, i thought was me uh go ahead go ahead i'll ask later no more thank you sonia so talika thank you for the presentation and uh, I have always been wanting to visit this museum but unfortunately whenever I have traveled in off season I could not visit. I would like to share my experience with you of my Gujarat travels and I would like to ask you a question. So in Gujarat what I what I've seen that uh, the tribal people are really spoiled. They always ask for money because uh, the product that they make it's the tourists especially the foreign tourists they cannot purchase those products. It's a uh, is difficult because they are really they are not uh, equipped to pack them and give it to the tourists so they cannot buy it but uh, but when clients are visiting these uh, settlements the local communities they always expect money because their products are not being purchased so they always expect money and if you don't give money they become little hostile okay. so and uh, since gujarat is like promoted as community based tourism textile tours ethnic tourism so this is a real challenge there coming to central india now the the whole focus is on uh, safaris so our communities are still protected so i would like to know that uh, if if there is a like if you could do uh, the village tours that you have spoken about cultural immersions that you have spoken about is there a price to it like if uh, when you're talking about community based tourism if a certain like if the, the whole package comes with certain price that is going to the community directly because for the tourist it may not be possible to buy the products uh, unless they are equipped to handle it properly courier it to them and how do we protect their uh, culture because yes as uh, kar said uh, begging i have seen in gujarat like children have started begging whenever they see tourists they will say paisa 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 even in uh, odisha when you click the pictures they will first they will ask for money then only they will allow to get click so these are very sensitive issues and uh, what we do at the uh, abercrombie and ken we kind of we have a a document that uh, we give it to the guides to train them how to handle such situations so as a tour operators we all have to come together to solve this issue otherwise their culture will be spoiled and uh, and the whole experience will be diluted it won't be an authentic so let's, experience let's, um, let's do you want do you want to to lika do you want to answer that um, uh, i could answer that for her uh, basically uh, 
I, um, as I stressed in the very beginning that you need to be very sensitive when you are dealing with indigenous communities, you have to respect their, uh, uh, you know, their viewpoint, their mindset. And as, um, you know, other people have mentioned on this forum that we do not want to encourage any kind of begging or asking for money. So it is the responsibility of the traveler to ensure that, you know, they do not hand out money. They do not, uh, you know, encourage those practices. And going back to the art forms, and it's not that uh, when you say that it is not available to visitors, it is the job, it is the responsibility of all the local resorts and hotels in that region to have curated uh, shops in their, uh, you know, uh, maybe lodge, like I have done at Singinawa, which sells all these curated uh, handicrafts, or, you know, you, you can have an art gallery, you can request, there are so many art galleries in Gujarat, they can be requested to, you know, come forward and sell their uh, handicrafts. In fact, a must art gallery, which is one of my galleries, we uh, sell a lot of handicrafts and paintings from Gujarat as well. And people from all corners of the world are buying these art forms. So, you know, Mustard Gallery is just one little gallery in uh, Delhi. If many more people open these kind of indigenous art galleries all over India and take my journey forward, we'd have a lot of people, uh, you know, supporting these artisans. So I, I think we should just, you know, keep working at it. That's my viewpoint. Oh, sure. Thank you, Tolika. Um, I'm, hi, Julian. Thanks for letting me ask the question. Can I just yeah. before I ask that question? One is, uh, Sukriti, I think you're thinking of it wrong. Recently, we were hired by, uh, by Gujarat Tourism to kind of give them a synopsis on the current situation. I'll go into that later, but let me give you a small example of what's happening in Mumbai. The Dhobi Ghat community of Mumbai is about to ban all international tour operators from coming there. A recent study, case study made by Harvard Business School shows that they lose 20% productivity because of tours. Who's going to pay them for that? So I think there has to be a responsible, when you talk about responsible tourism, it's not just taking them and maybe someone will offer them money, but I like what Tulika is doing to make it sustainable, to create jobs from them, to make it mandatory. Look at what grassroots has done. They make it mandatory that a payment goes, that you take a local guide and you, you kind of benefit the communities. The same thing Tulika pointed out. We're now working with the Garo and the, and the North Indian communities in the in the tea belts, and they're very proud cultures. So it's not about begging for them; it's about making sure that you benefit the ecosystems that you are benefiting of. Mm. It has to be a win-win. Otherwise, it's going to be really. Uh, it's basically not sustainable then. And the second point I was making is that I'm seeing that more increasingly, China's reports have just come out. People who used to take travel tours and tour operators are now changing unless the tour operator is very sustainable towards the local operators. That just That's my comment. My question was this, that having heard a lot of data and what we, we are basically a media and data company, uh, media tech tra uh, data and sus sustainable strategy company, I see that this travel is going to become more and more immersive than observational. So today, travelers now from Mumbai, which we're seeing only with the bubbles open, are now going into the villages. They love it because they don't want to see the Vardi craftspeople or buy from them. They're happier to extend their stays or for Basar artists in the, in, the, in the Mathiran belt. They want to be learning those art forms. Now, in those belts, quickly, they've been uh, evolving their homestays and small resorts are evolving to meet that need. I just want to know from the, the community that is today online, if they have hotels, resorts, or tourism professionals, how are the other communities evolving to create a long tail of travel? How are the other communities evolving to create um, this, this transformational travel where people will take back something more than an experience? They take back a skill set. Sorry if my question's very long. <laughs> Thanks, Sonia. Uh, do, do you want to do you want to answer that, Talika? Is is anyone else qualified there to do that as well? Talika, over to you. Um, well, I agree with what she's saying, and uh, uh, I think definitely you have to be sensitive on uh, you know everything that you're doing. You have to be 
you know, whenever you're engaging yourself with indigenous communities, you have to make sure that you, uh, you know, give them a platform, you're sensitive, everything should be done with a lot of, uh, you know, sensitivity. And uh, you have to, you know, when you're working on, um, you know, giving them that exposure, it should be done from all ends, you know, it can be done from the city, it can done, it can be done locally. So um, I think um, uh, that's, you know, my take on it. And I see a few more questions. If somebody else has any questions, they can go ahead. Otherwise, I could answer the questions which are written down. Sonia, does it answer your question? I mean, are you satisfied with them? Uh, the, it surely did answer my comment, but my question still remains, how are we going to evolve to make sure that we can make more from travel than, we do, than we're currently doing? So my question was more, how are resorts, tour operators are going to evolve to create from observational travel, which Tulika spoke about, to immersive travel that Kur has just written, or Kar, I'm sorry, Kar has just written, where he's training people, he's giving transformative travel experiences to people. So earlier, we just wanted an experience. Today, with money being so tough, with time being a big uh, aspect, we will want to also take back a learning skill. How are resorts going to equip themselves to create the long tail of travel, which is something we're seeing globally? Julian was right. Maybe this is not the right crowd, and I think I'm taking the, the question. No, well, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I mean, it's difficult to predict what's going to happen in the future. Uh, can I add um, something here? Is that okay? This is Shobha. Yeah, yeah, Shobha, please. Shobha, yeah. Uh, Sonia, just to answer, you know, in a very small way, I would say, at Singinawa, like, for example, we have the local Gond artists who do come in and people actually do sessions with them and they actually try and, you know, make a whole this one. So they understand how that art form works and what is it and all. So if that answers your question in these small little ways, many of the lodges, many of the places actually do involve the artists. Like there are places where, you know, people involve them in that whole local pottery sessions, like, you know, when we have the Andrita Pottery Studio, you know, that uh, Shubham there comes into our resort there in Rak, and he actually, you know, they do do that whole uh, experience of doing it themselves, if that is exactly what your question is from what I asked. Exactly, I think, Shubha, you answered it. What's happening in Andrita, what's happening in Mathiran, this is what I was talking about. You know, see, like, yeah, at Singinawa, we do this. We have these sessions, and you know, actually, Tulika has actually is instrumental in putting that particular experience in place there. And people do opt for it. They also do things like you know, uh, having you know the beggars, uh, uh, bamboo for beggars kind of a thing. So do you you do an activity with them because that's something which is a livelihood for them. So we do have a lot of these kind of activities which are interactive at our places. If that answers your question. Yeah, but I think there is a lot of further scope to expand that, you know, because mm -hmm. as the world is moving Absolutely. towards more immersive experiences, so it's, it's time that uh, lodges, travel agents, uh, the community thinks how we can involve more ourselves with the communities because until unless they get involved and they see the benefit, they will not be for conservation. For them, that's the last thing. It's it, For them, it's more important what is the money or income they are able to generate. So we have we as an industry have to really give serious, really serious thought to it and see how we can evolve it further. I think that's that's my take, uh, Sonia. Probably. The, the key, to, the key to is, is, is allowing uh, communities to get to to catalyze communities to offer it uh, and to put together opportunities to allow that to happen where they control it. The, the key to this is they they have some control over it. If they don't have control over it it will ultimately be exploited and that's when it feels it feels wrong so the key is to create communities and i think singh and i has always had a, a fantastic local relationships with their communities um and the, the element to is to is to allow resorts to maybe help communities to catalyze it not for us to impose our ways and allow them to community to catalyze it get their artists get their potters get a, actually building something that is interactive and immersive, that then becomes something that they offer to us rather than, than we offer our guests to them. It's the other way around. And if we can get that much more community spirit based, when it's their offering, they will take ownership of it and be much better at, we have to help them price it. We have to make sure that works. And if you look at any great community based tourism from 
you know, from places in uh, around the world. It's usually when the community is taking charge of it, control it, uh, make sure it doesn't get out of hand, um, have, a, have a very close relationship, have guides that are, that are of their own people and communities, they've been very proud of it. And that's just the way it can do it. Any other way, imposing our ideas on them is, is, is usually the wrong way around. I yeah, absolutely agree. You put it brilliantly, Julian, brilliantly. This is exactly what only is happening in India. I see Indonesia doing it differently. I'm doing it in Mal Malaysia. Even Pakistan doesn't do it the way we are doing it in India. Even Pakistan has the onus on the communities and the communities offer it. So there's a sense of responsibility. They don't expect you to pay a certain set or, okay, you'll be patronized to this level. It's a mutually beneficial relationship. You're coming on my land, you're coming on my soil, you're working, you're watching, you're taking pictures, you damn well give me a benefit. And that's not happening in India. That's the only place I'm not seeing it. In. Sorry if I'm, I'm, I'm someone mentioned- No, me. but I think we are evolving yeah. towards it. So I think we are evolving towards it, Sonia. I mean, I see that's what, um, I think that's what, uh, what would you say, Julian, to liquor? I mean, I think we are evolving. Yes, we are, because, you know, if every lodge owner or every, uh, you know, a person who's a traveler, if they realize that, you know, they can give back to the indigenous communities, then, uh, you know, I, in fact, I, we encourage our guests, I encourage my friends to pick up, uh, you know, um, even clothing made by indigenous communities, uh, you know, so if you, if you're kind of supporting local weavers, local artisans, you are giving back to the indigenous communities. That's why I liked your model, because you are, and you're constantly supporting it. And I also believe in um, uh, academic books. So that's why uh, through the Mustard Gallery, I've taken out uh, a whole series of uh, books on indigenous art, whether it's from Rajasthan, whether it's from Maharashtra, whether it's from Central India. So, you know, if you, the more books there are on indigenous art and culture, then you would be sensitizing people about them. You would be telling them that, you know, what kind of handicrafts they're making. So you open out a huge market for that. That's the, you know, uh, one of my missions. I think one of the things we can also do, but just is storytelling. And I think if, if we can somehow find communities that have very good storytellers, maybe they can tell it in, in a language that you can translate or they can, can be acted or they are fantastic mimics or whatever they are of whatever it is. Those people are very, very good way of introducing a tribal culture to, to, uh, to visitors. Um, but for me, as, a, as someone who used to put together itineraries which involve culture, the absolute essence is time, giving communities time. If you give them time, they'll give, they'll return with time. And that relationship will generate the best and most advantageous benefits to both sides. Um, they'll get to know you, you get to know them. And, and so when you're putting together itineraries, which are very focused on, it's not just visit, 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 it's actually time, um, and, and time before you get out your cameras, time before you, all that stuff, and the interactive stuff we're talking about, the orientation, also really critical, get, get people learning from the artists, make them feel special at what they do, encouraging all that. But time is the absolute essence with any travel and tribal related uh, interaction. If you don't give them time, it's not going to work. Uh, may I make one more comment, please? Please, yeah. Uh, I see Tilika as a mirror. She is like the mirror of the community, where the community bounces off what it is. And through her books and her pictures, she's able to say that. Now, we've been asked to document all these communities across the regions, and we're doing it on our own. So we're a group of filmmakers and technologists. who are doing this on their own to put the countries directly on a platform. This being a given, we're seeing that they are natural storytellers. So what Tilika is saying and what you're saying is kind of as a synergy, which can catalyze, catalyze communities. Instead of having an external storyteller, you take them to them and you mirror what they are. You kind of empower them. So Devarai Art Village, uh, to make regular sales happen with the, with the craftspeople, they've created a partnership between Speedex uh, uh, or uh, local posts and local post office to receive and get payments. So they have 
uh, money throughout the year. And I think that's the way people like Tulika are leading it from the forward and taking it off the old sponge of the, the, the villager models. What do you feel? Any, any other, um, Tulika, do you want, do you want to um, do that? I mean, Tulika, you're muted. Tulika, you're muted. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> Um, well, um, I just wanted to share something with everyone uh, going forward to what Julian said that, you know, they're, they're fabulous storytellers. And, um, uh, you know, I've just authored a book on the butterflies of Kana. I'm just going to show it to everyone here, whoever hasn't seen it. Um, and in fact, I ran it through Varun as well. Uh, and I thank Varun for this because, um, you know, there were many images uh, which we were thinking of for the cover. And uh, well, uh, instead of going for a, you know, photograph of a butterfly as a cover, I decided to encourage one of my Gond artists from Central India to paint the cover. And, you know, when I sent him a copy of the book, he was so happy that here there is a natural history book, which has all the, you know, various uh, butterflies and the eggs and everything. And his work is on the very, you know, is on the cover of the book. And uh, we've also got um, Pichwai artists from Rajasthan to paint uh, absolute identical images of the moths at the back. So, you know, uh, just by involving uh, indigenous and folk artists, even in natural history, uh, you know, uh, academic books, that's when you can really, uh, you know, bring them, uh, lift them up is what yeah. I suggest. So actually, we that's really a, just the right way to instill pride in them. I think that's, which is so very important. So I think that's fantastic. Very good. I mean, so this is, I think, the world's first uh, natural history book, which has indigenous art in it. Okay, great. Absolutely. Good. Um, I, we've had a, we've had a good chance to to um, talk about weaving tribal culture and and I just wanted to thank uh, Tulika for her input and and wonderful efforts and, and fantastic um, work that you're doing there amongst your communities in Kana with your in, indigenous art um, encouraging that making it recognised the world over which is fantastic for these people. Um, indigenous communities are critically endangered and, and need all the support they possibly can um, and to for lots of people to believe in them. Um, so in, in terms of what Tough Tigers encourages, please, if you are in the travel community, if you are looking to put together programs, itineraries that are culturally sensitive, uh, and we encourage you to do that, to work with people on the ground who really know what they're talking are really doing good stuff research them um, uh, make sure that what they're offering is very good everyone will see us we do tribal villages a week and visit whatever it is the reality is that there are very few people are doing it very well and you need to be focusing on them and encouraging others to catalyze communities to come together to put something that they put on the table and you can help guide them, of course, on that, but allow them to be the owners of that and to set the basis for that relationship. If we can do that, we'll have much, much better and much integrated and much more sustainable travel programs um, with communities being the direct beneficiaries of it. Um, so I really welcome that. I'm happy to discuss it off, off the um, offline, but it's a really important, it's a very underrated part of India's, India's present sort of travel offerings. Um, and, and usually it's not done very well. So we, we need to get much, much better as a travel community and the immersive um, and time basis are really important. But Tulika, huge thanks. Um, thank really so interesting. Much. And I thank yeah. everyone for their kind words, which they've penned down. It really means a Tulika, uh, some people want your, I mean, Sonia, and uh, some people want your contact. So if, uh, though I we- it down. You, you have? Okay, 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 okay. okay. Yes, do. Will you put that down? That'll be good. Please feel free to do that. Um, this Hi, will... uh, Julian, can I add something? I wanted to speak. Absolutely. 
Okay, so I, I sorry, I joined little late. I, my name is Riday Gupta. I, I heard uh, so many things about that we, we wanted to change so many things related to environment, tribals, and everything. Uh, I feel I think if Tough Tiger can start doing something from, uh, you know, thinking of a generation conversion, right? So these kind of changes cannot be done. It should not be done only with the adults. I think Tough Tiger, if, if do something, start with an educational institute where you have kids, you know. So after 10 years, believe me, I think we will have a humongous change instead of trying to change only the adults because the kids will grow with that kind of a thinking, but we are actually talking about only to discuss with the adults. So I think Tough Tiger if can think something to start with the educational institutes, probably with the kids, schools, colleges, maybe some kind of a seminars. Generally, uh, good schools conduct uh, new New Year, uh, you know, their functions. There, probably, we can do some kind of, uh, you know, um, I don't know what, but something. If you can come up with uh, education institutes, we can start, and we can change a huge uh, changes in the generations coming forward. That is how I feel. Thanks, Rudy. That's interesting. And uh, yeah, Julian has, has got it. a task. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. Just credit. Oh. Um, <laughs> I mean, the reality is that Tough Tigers, the way we work is we work with lots and lots of people all on the ground doing, doing fantastic stuff. We encourage the really good stuff. And, and of course, Talika's Lodge is one of our outstanding, outstanding rank lodges. It's, it's they're catalyzing all the things we believe in and how they're doing it. So um, that's a good example. Um, and we encourage those people on the ground who know the terrain, know the people, know the community, employ community members to help that catalytic conversion. That's the basis under which Toft. So that only takes a little step for them to get involved in educating the communities and, and doing lectures with their naturalists and guides, doing all that. Mm-hmm. And that is happening. That is happening with the best people. Mm-hmm. It's happening brilliantly in India. They are so, such good examples. The reality is that there are lots of other horror stories too. So it's getting the good ones to to be the main the main beneficiaries of of tourism and not the poor poor examples. Um, so that's that's how we operate and how we do. It. And we always encourage that as part of the deal. Okay, it's part okay. of how you happen- become an outstanding. It may be happening, but I think I may not have seen in uh, metro cities, cities like Delhi, probably Gurgaon. I have not seen something has been happening towards yeah no that's that's Ooh. tough um that's that you'd need an immense operation but something like sanctuary asia runs all those kind of organizations um runs a massive membership kids club uh, tiger kids club fantastic operation that does okay. that sort of training so i really encourage it okay julian um, i i you could have fooled me. I always thought you were a capacity building um, session. I always thought that. And I always have learned something and taken it away from there. You never learn enough. And even now, like you rightly said, you're doing a lot of the grant. But is there a way of actually consolidating it and putting it in a, in a different format? Because all the sessions that I've come to, I've seen that most of the travel operators and people have been asking for that. They need this capacity building and upskilling when they're coming into a new world. Is it possible for you to do it in a, in a more formalized fashion? <laughs> Julian is yeah, <laughs> it's <laughs> it's a resource problem as much as anything, to be honest. And you know, we're a small little charity that you know works with um, uh, you know small numbers of, of members and, and stuff. So uh, you know, we have a capacity problem in terms of you know uh, you know teaching and learning and training. You know, where do you start? You know, one village or 10,000, it's, it's very difficult to do. And, and personally, we've always said what we aim to do is to catalyze the people on the ground to do that as part of their commitment to responsible tourism. So that is a really powerful way in which we can be very quickly across very right. large landscapes. But, you know, it doesn't always work. It's not always perfect. It, you know, pandemic doesn't help. <laughs> it yes. helps in lots of ways, but doesn't help. I mean, I don't know, Talika, if you... You know that you're one of our, our ground our ground people on the ground, you know, doing that all the time. Um, but anyway, I'm going to uh, call, call that a day. So thanks, everybody. I appreciate you all being with us. Thank you, everyone, for your kind words. It was lovely. We'll, we'll welcome us back. We do a lot of other talks. Happy to have you back again for any number of them. So please keep, keep us... Uh, 
keep informed with our various emails and stuff that we send you. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.